Hello everyone, this is John Mark Johnson Jr. again, host of Relationship and Truth. And today I'm going to be revisiting Mark chapter 1, verse 2. Now in a recent video I included it along with some other uh, fairly famous variants just simply to talk about biblical variants and understanding where they come from and that sort of thing. And um, I actually wound up receiving a comment on that video that I wound up deleting. And I delete a lot of the comments that could show up on my videos. Um, and it mostly has to do with whether or not I'm willing to interact with them at that point. And frankly, I get a lot more comments than I can interact with. And there's a lot of them that I just don't really have the time to interact with. It. Um, however, after it... Uh, after I deleted it and some time had gone by, I got to thinking about the issue and thought, you know, maybe I should have kept that comment around because there actually was some stuff in there that might be worth talking about. It was a person who was in favor, at least of the majority text, I believe, who was basically commenting that Mark 1-2 should read uh, prophets instead of Isaiah the prophet. And in the other video I talked about the basics of where that came from and what happened with that. Um, but for the sake of giving richer clarity, I decided that I would bring in some of the evidence that is cited in the United Bible, Society, United Bible Society's 5th edition of the Greek New Testament and uh, discuss some of the issues there. Excuse me just a second here. Now, the way that most textual critics go about establishing an ancient text is by dint of sufficiently independent witnesses. And it's kind of like in, um, you can think of almost uh, kind of reconstructing a, a crime scene. And if you get relatively independent witnesses to a crime, who give you uh, the same information, at least at certain points of their story, they're different witnesses. And so what is happening before the crime, what is happening afterward is going to be different. But at the moment of the crime that they witnessed, if they give you the same details at that particular point that you're interested in, that's pretty good evidence that that's probably what happened. Now, if you get um, a good number of witnesses that aren't relatively independent, but they still give you the same story. Well, it, what they say could be true or not true, but the problem is if they agree on pretty much every single thing, the chances are they're not independent witnesses. You know, if you start talking to people and they say, I didn't see nothing, I didn't hear nothing, and this has not been rehearsed, and you go to the next one and they say, I didn't see nothing, I didn't hear nothing, and this has not been rehearsed, eh, something funny is going on. And all the information matches up a little too much, it can be a bit of an issue. Um, what a lot of textual scholars are going to look at is, of course, the age of the particular witness. Early is eh, typically better. Um, there are early witnesses that are unreliable. Of course, that's a possibility, but typically earlier is better. And then they're also going to look for at the quality of the particular witness. Is this a witness that in other places has shown itself to be uh, a pretty good representative of what was originally or what isn't. So you've looked at other places, places that are sufficiently clear, so, uh, uh, places where textual scholars are typically fairly agreed on what the, uh, the reading should be. Is it, re uh, is it more reliable in those cases or is it one of the ones where it doesn't match up with what uh, would seem to be the most likely case? So there's the age of the manuscript, there is uh, the particular reliability of that manuscript that goes into question, and then, as I've been talking about, the other major issue is the issue of independence. Is it different enough from the other witnesses that we can say that it really comes from its own stream? It really has its own genesis and origin. And if you've been following any of the stuff that's been going on with um, CBGM, the coherence-based genealogical method, one of the things that the data is starting to show is that as far as text types are concerned, there really is only one 
text uh, type that is actually cohesive enough that you can say it really belongs to one particular text type and doesn't have anything in, it in common with anything else. It is uniquely identifiable no matter where it shows up, and that is the Byzantine text type. Um, it is definitely a unique one, and for those who are uh, maybe uninitiated, when we're talking about the New Testament text, um, for a long time, before we start doing a lot of the computer analysis for a long time, the standard way of thinking about the independence of witnesses was the text type that they belonged to. And there were some key uh, markers that would that uh, scholars would classify the text by. If it has this set of variants, it belongs to this group. If it has this set of variants, it belongs to this other group. And there were quite a few different groups that were talked about. There was the Alexandrian text type. There was the Western text type. For some people, and even and nowadays they still talk about it, there was the Caesarean text type. Excuse me here. <coughs> um, and then, of course, uh, there was the, uh, the Syrian or the Byzantine text type. And the, uh, the Syrian or the Byzantine text type is basically the majority text. And what we've come to realize after going through and doing much more extensive collations than we've ever done before, this has been one of the advantages of CBGM. There's lots of things about CBGM that I'm, I'm definitely a little hesitant about, but one of the advantages of the CBGM is that we've started to examine manuscripts in a lot greater comparison with each other. There's been a lot more collation that's been done. And what has been found out is that these other text types that we've been talking about, other than the Byzantine text type, other than the Syrian one, is that while, say, for example, the Alexandrian text type is, there, there are certain readings that you can classify the text by, it, when it comes to all the other readings uh, that are in the text, well, those vary enough and overlap with the other supposed text types out there, like the Western, Caesarean, if it ever existed in the first place, that there's not really a whole lot of points in really calling it out, because the places in which they agree in their variation is actually smaller than the places where they disagree in their variation, and so it's not really useful to call them a text type. Um, what is the case is that pretty much all of these other things that used to be considered text types are really just a spectrum of variation and the vast majority of these other text types are proving to be relatively independent witnesses. The Byzantine, on the other hand, has a phenomenal amount of uh, coherence and initially that might sound like a good thing but it's a bad thing when you're actually trying to reconstruct something. Um, because even though you might have thousands and thousands and thousands of these manuscripts, which we do, there's thousands of Byzantine manuscripts, thousands upon uh, thousands of Byzantine manuscripts. And the estimates for how many of our manuscripts are Byzantine manuscripts, um, usually is somewhere between 90 and 95 percent that we'd estimate would fall in that category. So the vast majority of Greek New Testament manuscripts fall in that category. The problem, though, is that they are so related to each other that it's pretty clear um, that they really only have one particular source, and it seems to be a fairly late source. It's kind of like this. Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry, I'm still fighting a cough that I've had for a little while now, and I'm real bad at, in that regard. There's sometimes where I have coughs for uh, have a pretty bad cough for like months on end. It doesn't really affect a whole lot of everything else for me, fortunately, but just coughing at random places and other people kind of start standing away from me. At this point, I'm not contagious or anything like that. I just got a real bad cough. But yeah, it's a little annoying to say the least. So, um, as I was saying, if I can remember where I was, um, the Byzantine manuscripts, there's a ton of them, but very, 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 very similar. Uh, in fact, so similar that uh, it's become really clear that the Byzantine text type really should just be considered one uh, witness. It's not really an independent witness. Uh, they're all so close that it really calls that in the question. It's and like I've already mentioned the uh, the example of you know a, a crime case, and if you have witnesses who agree in every single detail, you might as well just have 
the one witness. That doesn't necessarily make them more true or less true. There's just a lot of them. And another example that I used in the other video was that of the story of the Little Mermaid, and you can do this with a lot of uh, children's fairy tales. Uh, there's usually a historical version that came up first, you know, sometimes from Hans Christian Andersen or the Brothers Grimm or something like that. And then Disney gets a hold of it. And Disney will make it into this nice flowery thing that's just all sorts of wonderful. Um, has nothing to do with the original version that uh, showed up, but they make it nice and flowery and wonderful, and it gets propagated all over the place. And so there are tons and tons of copies of the Disney version out there, and most people, you know, and even worldwide, will recognize the Disney version, and they know the Disney version, and they know the, the Disney version of the characters, so on and so forth. And there's lots of people that have never read or heard or seen a production of the Hans Christian Andersen orig originals or the uh, uh, Brothers Grimm originals. I have no idea what they are. And it's because the Disney version has just been propagated and copied so many times. And, I mean, there's just tons and tons and tons of copies of the Disney versions that are out there now, uh, whether they be digital copies, DVDs, used to be the VHSs, uh, just all over in the culture. Pretty much, you know, every little kid will wind up learning at least some of the the Disney cartoon versions. Now, the now Disney has been going into the um, the digital animation more and more. Uh, where they have the 3D rendering and those kinds of things, and also some of the live-action versions, and in time those might take over. But for right now, the Disney cartoon versions are kind of the iconic version. But of course, historically, they're not the original, even though they're the most common. And even though you might find somebody, um, or groups of people, even, that will, you ask them to bring you a copy of The Little Mermaid, and they bring you maybe a copy of the little uh, mermaid that occurs in different uh, different forms one pe person will show you a digital uh, version another one will show you a vhs version the other one the dvd version but so they vary in minor ways but when you look at them it's all the disney cartoon version of the little mermaid and if you might be able to find thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands of these things it doesn't make them original just because there's a ton of them and so Textual scholars, when they look at the Byzantine text type, they're so incredibly similar, most of them. It's pretty clear that they come from a common source. The amount of variation is relatively minor. Um, it, what they're looking at is one particular uh, text that basically has become standardized, but there is no guarantee that it's the original just because it's plentiful any more than the fact that the Disney version of The Little Mermaid is plentiful would guarantee that it's the original. Of course, that's not good logic. And one of the basic standards that believing textual scholars would have is that the method of understanding the Bible is not significantly different from understanding any other work in history. That is, we believe that God used ordinary means to communicate with his people. He didn't do something that required a secret decoder ring or do something that would require you to think in vastly different ways. He knows how mankind think he gave mankind the brain that he has that, and the common sense that man has, or at least the common sense that man should have. Um, he is the one who stands behind laws of logic and all these kinds of things. It's only because of God that any of this kind of stuff even exists in the first place. And God gave us laws of logic. They exist because of him. God gave us common sense. God gave us a means of understanding the world around us. And no, I'm not a proponent of, you know, nature being the 67th book of the Bible or anything even remotely close to that. Um, what I'm saying is the basic things that the Bible would tell you. Take Moses uh, speaking in Deuteronomy when he speaks to the Israelites. He describes the word of God that has been given, the commandments of God that has been given, as something that is very near you. You don't have to go looking out in the mountains or in the great depths of the sea. It's something that is right in front of your face that's ordinary, that's, uh, that's usable in the ordinary sense. And that is how God's people have, by and large, understood God's uh, word. 
and whenever we deviate from that pattern of understanding it as you would anything else, you wind up with really strange method of, methods of interpretation. For example, in history, there was a method of interpretation that was called the allegorical methodology, where everything that's in scripture basically had an allegorical meaning. And okay, here's the plain meaning of the text, but here's the secret meaning. And you wind up with all kinds of weird stuff when that happens. And there were some guys in history that you know, by and large, were actually terrible as far as their doctrine and theology, but still, the whole allegorical methodology thing, you're looking at some of their interpretations of certain texts of Scripture, and you're just going, yeah, I, um, I'm not sure that anyone who would have originally written that, or who originally read it, or in the case of things that were spoken first, who originally heard it, would have gotten that out of it. That's a little bit of a stretch. The whole common sense aspect of interpretation, there's a number of people in history that kind of left that off. And it always creates problems when you go away from the standard of the due use of ordinary means. That is the standard that, um, especially if you're a Reformed Christian, that is the standard, a due use of the ordinary means. So what would you do in any other case if you wanted to know the truth? Because God's truth doesn't change from case to case. If we want to know the truth about this thing over here, what version of the Little Mermaid was original, and we want to know this thing over here, what version of the Bible was original, the standard of truth should be exactly the same before and between them. And if we're not going to accept the majority of witnesses when it comes to the Little Mermaid, which is the Disney version, because historically it's pretty clear that the Hans Christian Andersen version came first, if we're not going to accept the majority version there for understanding what was original, then we shouldn't be doing that with the Bible either. It's a matter of consistency. God's truth is a consistent truth because God himself is consistent, and therefore what he puts forward is going to be consistent. If it's something that is a reliable standard of truth over here, it's going to be reliable here. And if it's not reliable over here, then it's not going to be reliable over there. It doesn't mean that you couldn't happen upon the truth that way, but the question is, is it reliable? Is it consistent? And the majority of witnesses argument isn't. Like I said, the majority of witnesses, when it comes to the New Testament text, yeah, they are in vast agreement, that is true. But they are so tight that the one thing that is very clear, clear is that they have one or very, very few sources. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, very, very, very tight. Um, it was at a point where the New Testament text was greatly being standardized. And it's also worth pointing out that 90% of our New Testament manuscripts come from the 9th through the 16th centuries, which is fairly late in the game. You have Christianity, of course, in the sense of the Messiah coming originating in the 1st century. That's when people are right, uh, start writing about it is in the 1st century and finish writing about it in the 1st century. And then... You don't see this text type developing in at least in a major way until the 9th century, and that's where the bulk of the manuscripts come from. So there's literally almost an entire millennium there where this text type is very much so a minor player. Um, but, okay, so that's a little bit of the background here and what some of the issues are that we're dealing with when it comes to Mark 1-2. All right, looking at... Uh, the picture that's on the screen right here, this is a photo of the UBS-5 uh, textual apparatus at Mark 1-2. And I'm just using a part of this for review purposes. Obviously, I don't own anything. Uh, if you want to buy a copy, go and buy it from them. Please don't pay me any money on account of this. I don't own any of it. Okay, so disclaimers out there. Uh, this is uh, what the uh, textual apparatus looks like. And tells you that this is in verse 2, and the little 2 is just the superscript of which variant you're talking about. So it's variant 2, and it's in verse 2. That's what the second 2 means. And then in braces here, it has an A. And what that means is that the textual editors are absolutely sure that this is the correct reading. A is a rating of certain. This is something that isn't really debatable as far as the editors are concerned. And they say that the reading is en to he zaya to prophete, which when you translate it is in he who is Isaiah the prophet. And it gives some witnesses for those. 
Um, Aleph, Hebrew letter Aleph, stands for Codex Sinaiticus. B is Vaticanus. L, Delta 33, 565, 892, 1241. And um, one out of four places that origin uh, mentions this particular verse. Okay, and why does it say that the one out of four? Well, this is a fairly frequent thing that happens with the church fathers. Church fathers are witnesses of the New Testament text and the biblical text in general. But the problem is that they're not usually super consistent because a lot of times when they quote the scripture, they quote it from memory. And there'll be certain parts, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> and there'll be certain parts that are somewhat modifiable. And sometimes when people quote the uh, biblical text in English, will wind up paraphrasing the text instead of actually giving the exact quote. Sometimes we'll get a little part here or there different, not enough to significantly affect the meaning in most cases, but we'll paraphrase sometimes instead of giving the exact quote. And the early church fathers weren't any different in that regard. And one of the issues here is the article to. That article is something that will vary uh, by dialect and register in Koine Greek. Uh, Koine Greek was not an absolutely uniform language and it tended to vary a little bit um, depending on who was speaking it when and um, and at what time and it's in the history of the development of language you're talking about. So it, it varied by place and it varied throughout time and attaching the article to the proper name is something that could vary quite a bit. Um, like I said, it's basically he who is I, Isaiah. It's um, to, a rough comparison in English would be something like Mr. Isaiah. Um, it's kind of something that makes the text a little bit more formal, but it doesn't greatly change the meaning. Whether you have that article in there or not, it's still talking about Isaiah. And so one time when Origen quotes it, he has that formal marker in there, that article right before the proper name. And this is the one that um, a good many textual scholars, not just the UBS scholars, but a good many textual scholars in general who accept that, uh, whether they uh, be biblical Christians or not, but who accept that you would understand um, the Bible in basically the same means that we'd use in understanding other texts. That the Bible is understandable through a due use of the ordinary means. There's no secret decoder rings. There is no secret knowledge that has to be passed down alongside the Bible in order uh, to get the, the specific uh, meanings out of it. It's a due use of the ordinary means. And standards that we wouldn't accept anywhere else, we're not going to accept here. So if we're not going to accept the majority argument when it comes to which version of The Little Mermaid is original, we shouldn't do that with the Bible either. Those kinds of people look at this and they say this one is the original text. And it's because this combination of witnesses is has a, both an earlier attestation and especially a more reliable and more diverse attestation than you're going to get for the other ones. But the next one that they give here is pretty close to the same thing. And in fact, in English, we usually wouldn't translate it any differently. It's in Heziah to prophete, which sounds really similar. The only difference is that after the N, there is no to. It just simply drops uh, the article in front of the proper name. And again, that was something that would vary uh, from region to region and it would also vary throughout time whether or not that would be included. Um, it would usually make the text a little bit more formal in a way. Um, but also, one thing that happens with a lot of languages as time goes on is that formalities tend to get dropped. Look at modern English, for example. Um, saying things like uh, Mr. Rogerson and those kinds of things are starting to fall by the wayside a bit. And some of the um, titles that would be in front of women's names, for example, are also starting to be uh, dropped. For men, it's usually just been Mr. or something like that. Uh, but Women would usually have a little bit more complexity in their titles. There would be Miss for unmarried women, Mrs. for married women. And to a certain extent that still exists, but the formality and the tendency of using it has dropped off. And so now sometimes it sounds a little stilted. You know, if you say, hey, Mr. Rogerson, 
Well, nowadays, Mr. Rogerson might look at you and say, Mr. Rogerson is my dad. Because it sounds stilted to them. It sounds too formal to them. And so it's not natural for them to speak that way. And sometimes when copying the text, if it didn't sound natural to them, if it sounded too stilted, or it's just simply not the way that they would say it, they look at the line and, okay, so it's talking, it says that this is in Isaiah the prophet, and it doesn't really pick up with them that the article is there because they're not used to using it. They'll go and copy it the way they're used to, and they'll drop the article. Uh, but as far as significant meaning is concerned, it's the same. And if you were to translate it in English, a lot of people would translate it the exact same way with or without the article. I translate it differently, but I'm weird. Most people don't. So this reading is actually basically the same as the other one except for the article. And there's a list of um, uh, support for it. You have D, which is Codex Bizet, which is a very strange manuscript. Uh, theta, F1 stands for family one. This is basically the same thing that the uh, United Bible Societies has done with the Byzantine text. F1 is very similar to the Byzantine text, and a lot of times basically is the Byzantine text. But specifically, F1 represents a family of manuscripts that vary in very, very, very slight ways. So much so that they're not really independent witnesses at that point. Um, we can tell that they've basically all had the same original, or at least all go back to the, the same original um, very, very consistently so. And so when they're cited, they're cited as just one witness most of the time, just family one. And then there's 205, 700, 1071, 1243. Little uh, italic L there stands for lectionary, so that's lectionary 253. Uh, ARM is the Armenian, and not Armenian with an I, it's Armenian with an E. It's a geographic location, it's a place. Uh, Geo is the Georgian, then Irenaeus. And you'll notice, um, <coughs> excuse me, that next to the Irenaeus is a little GR that stands for the Greek version of Irenaeus. Um, Irenaeus originally wrote in Greek, spoke in Greek, and all those kinds of things. He's one of the Greek church fathers. However, uh, somewhere in the third or the fourth century, his work got translated into Latin, and there was two different manuscript streams that came from Irenaeus at that point. There was the Greek stream that was the language that he originally spoke in, and it went one direction, and then the Latin translation went another uh, direction. And a lot of times with the early church fathers, this happens. Um, you have these early church fathers that wrote in the original time and place early on. And as time went on, they, the different places where Christians were, well, they would start sharing their stuff with each other. And that would include what their particular people had written about the Bible or written about Christianity, so on and so forth. And they would start making copies for each other. And if those people spoke different languages, in the East, they usually spoke Greek. In the West, they usually spoke Latin. If they spoke different languages, they would have to translate. That's what happened with Irenaeus. And then the manuscript traditions diverged from that point. So you have Irenaeus and his original language favors this reading where it's talking about Isaiah the prophet singular. Um, doesn't have the article on it, but it still gives Isaiah the prophet. And then you have origin three out of four. We had origin one out of four before when it had the article. Most of the places where origin, he was also one of the, the Greek church fathers. Most of the places where origin talks about uh, Mark 1, 2, he, um, he does not have the article on there, but in all of the cases that we have Origen citing this, there's four places total, one with the article, three without, in all of them, it's still Isaiah the prophet, singular. Then you have Serapion, Epiphanius, Severian, Hesychus, and I pronounced that wrong, I'm sorry. And there's a few little variants in there, but they don't greatly affect a whole lot. Um, also included in the support uh, for this is the Atala, and, and the Atala, for those of you who don't know, is basically the old Latin form. Now, when you're talking about classical literature in general, Atala actually means something a little bit different, but when you're talking about New Testament texts, the Atala is referring to the Latin translations of the New Testament before the Vulgate came along. So these are 
Old Latin translations, the earliest Latin translations that we have of the New Testament before everything was standardized in the Vulgate. So they support it. And then we also have the Vulgate, uh, by and large, following along with this reading. And then there's uh, evidence from the Syriac, and there's particular forms of the Syriac that are cited here, uh, particular forms of the Coptic, that's what the COP is. And then Irenaeus, when he's translated into Latin, one out of three times, he has Isaiah the prophet singular. And then what's also interesting is that Origen in his Latin version, because like I said, a lot of church fathers, there's both a Greek version and a Latin version. For Greek church fathers, the Latin version is the translation. For Latin fathers, and you have to know who comes from where, for Latin fathers, it's the Greek version that's the translation. You have to know who was where and, and those kinds of things. Origen, the Latin is going to be the translation, but it's interesting though, even though it's the translation, that still goes back to the same reading as in the Greek. Well, technically in the Greek, there was one that was one way and one that was another way. And interestingly, in Latin, Latin doesn't have um, really a proper article like Koine Greek does, and even Koine Greek, it's still not a proper article. It's actually a very special pronoun is what it is, but that's a whole other discussion. Um, but even in the translation, it's still identifiable as being Isaiah, prophet, singular. Then we have Victorinus, Batau, uh, Chromatius. Uh, they don't have the prophet, they just have in Isaiah, but it's still singular. It's a single attribution to Isaiah. Ambrosiaster, Jerome, it's in parentheses because it's not quite the same quote, and Jerome was one of the Latin fathers. Um, so again, we're reading the Latin and trying to understand what his uh, Greek was, and so there's a little bit of variation there. Augustine was also a Latin father, but his is clear enough that we can tell it follows along with this particular reading. All right, so that is the evidence that's basically in favor of Isaiah the prophet, a singular attribution in Mark 1-2. And of course, and that's quite a bit. It's not the majority, but it's quite a bit of material. You have um, very early reliable manuscripts like um, Sinaiticus and Vaticanus. Uh, 33 is one. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, 33 comes quite a bit later, but it's still regarded as a very reliable manuscript. Um, you have some of the earliest uh, church fathers in their original languages, quoting this, like Origen and Irenaeus, our very early church fathers. And in their uh, original languages, and Origen even in his translation, and Irenaeus in one of the places in his translation, uh, in the translation of his work, that follows along with this, as well as a number of early translations, Armenian, Georgian, Etala, the Vulgate, Syriac, Coptic, etc. So, what is interesting here is that you have early testimony, you have um, the testimony from very key uh, witnesses, generally reliable witnesses, and then these witnesses, excuse me, are diverse. That is, there's lots of places where they disagree. And so it becomes very significant that they happen to agree on this point. So when you have a lot of witnesses, that disagree in a lot of other areas, but they could all agree on this particular detail, it's probably, a, it's real good evidence that this particular detail is correct. And the same thing would happen in a court case. If you get a bunch of different witnesses, they're all saying kind of different things, but they all happen to agree on this one particular detail in the case, you know, that the um, assailant was in fact wearing a green hoodie or something like that and the only one in the vicinity who had a green hoodie was this guy, well, it starts making a pretty strong case against this guy. This might be the only detail that they all can agree on, but if it's a unique identifier, it's a unique identifier, et cetera, et cetera, and on the case would go. But having witnesses that vary and yet agree on a particular point is a good thing. And in any ordinary situation, we would look at that and say it's pretty good evidence that that one thing that they agree on is probably true. But, like I said, there are the people on the other side who try to argue, well, it should be the, the majority wins. And that, that's not necessarily good evidence. 
like I said, we wouldn't normally accept majority evidence in pretty much anything in life if we actually wanted to use it as a standard of truth. Um, you can use it as a standard of feeling of, of what public opinion is and things like that, but not as a standard of truth. Uh, just simply doesn't work that way. So we wouldn't expect it to work that way regarding the Bible, but there are some strange people out there. All right, and then um, in the United Bible Society's fifth edition, we get into the reading that wound up becoming popular in early English translations of the Bible, and that's just simply because of the manuscripts they had available to them. In tois prophetais, in the prophets, plural. And you have A, that's uh, Alexandrinus. W is Washingtonianus. F13 is Family 13. So there's actually a number of manuscripts there. But like I said, they vary in relatively minor ways. And so as far as independent witnesses, they aren't really independent witnesses. So they're usually counted together. Uh, 28, 180, 579, 597, uh, 1006. Excuse me. Uh, 1010, 1292, 1342, 1424, 1505. BYZ, that stands for Byzantine. And then in brackets, they have uh, some archetypes of the Byzantine uh, text, some manuscripts uh, that generally follow along with all the other Byzantine manuscripts. And so those are generally the ones that are referred to uh, to give the Byzantine reading. Because like I said, the Byzantine texts usually are pretty close to each other. So you look in a few of them, you don't usually have to look in too many, and you'll get an idea of what the Byzantine reading is. That's how close together they are. Uh, the lect is lectionaries, meaning the vast majority of lectionaries that we have access to are going to read this way. VGMS is a manuscript that's of the Vulgate category. Before we had the Vulgate as a whole with no qualifier. Here this means that there is particular evidence in the Vulgate corpus as a whole, but it's relatively small. And then Syriac H, there was Syriac before, uh, but this is just basically one variant of the Syriac text. And then Coptic, uh, Boharic, MSMG, MS is manuscript, MG is, excuse me, <coughs> A marginal note. So what it's saying is that in the Coptic Boharic, there's one particular manuscript that happens to have a marginal note that reads this way. So, you know, it's my cousin's third, second cousin's friend who was related to my great aunt on my mother's side, 52 times removed. So yes, it's evidence, but it's pretty far out there by that point. Uh, the Ethiopic, that wasn't mentioned before. So this is a different, relatively early uh, translation. That one actually is somewhat uh, significant, but it tends to be a little bit later text uh, than some of the others. So for example, comparing the Itala, the Syriac, and the Coptic, those tend to be pretty early on. The Ethiopic, eh, like a century or two at best later. Uh, some of the Ethiopic manuscripts, of course, come considerably later, but there's usually a multi-century gap between them. Uh, Slavonic is also a very interesting early uh, translation, but again, it comes quite a bit down the line. Then we have Irenaeus mentioned again, and this time in Latin, in two out of three. So this, Irenaeus, remember, he's one of the Greek church fathers, so this is not his original language. And in translation, and the translation, like I said, was made probably second or third, uh, sorry, third or fourth century. He wrote in the second translation made in the third or fourth century. But the um, the manuscripts that we have of Irenaeus don't necessarily always go back. The Latin version of Irenaeus don't always go back to the third and fourth century. Some of them come along much later and there'll be sometimes alterations and changes along the way. Um, and so it's really hard to know exactly what was original here, but in the Latin form, it says prophets in the multiple. And then Asterius. And then last but not least, there is a conflated reading, and you find this a lot of times in certain manuscripts. If a scribe has available to them multiple manuscripts, and one set of manuscripts reads one way and the other set of manuscripts read the other way, they will usually, instead of picking one or the other, a lot of times you'll find uh, scribes that just decided to mesh the two together. So in um, a particular reading of the Atala, the old Latin translation. There's one particular uh, manuscript of the Atala 
that has this apparent reading. It's not, the text isn't super clear. That's what the VID means. It's, it, it appears, um, is basically what it means. It appears that this was what the, the scribe was trying to write, was trying to get across. And um, it's in Isaiah and in the prophets. So he combined the two readings. It's in Isaiah, it's in the prophets. Smash them together. <coughs> Excuse me. And so as far as quality of witness is concerned, it's in a different language. And this particular manuscript is a fairly late manuscript. It's like 7th century. And then it's a vid reading. It's not entirely apparent that this is actually what it was. It's, this is basically just our best guess as to what this was supposed to be. Um, and it's also a conflated reading. We have two very obvious lines, ones that say Isaiah the prophet, some of them with or without an article before Isaiah. But like I said, in Koine Greek, that's something that's more indicative of dialect. It's more indicative of register, whether you're trying to be formal or not, than it is actually something that's significant to the main meaning. So you have Isaiah the prophet on one side, you have a very clear line for that. And then on the other side, you have in the prophets, two very clear, distinct lines. And you have this one manuscript that shows up in the seventh century in a different language that happens to put the two readings together. <coughs> Excuse me. So pretty sure it's not that one. And pretty much everyone on every side of the spectrum would agree it's not that one. Okay, so this is uh, what happens as far as the textual evidence at Mark 1-2 is concerned. If you're not someone who buys into the majority is always right kind of thinking, or whatever argument happens to fit the text I like kind of thinking, which is not well, which is majority sometimes and extreme minority sometimes, um, if you don't fall into those kinds of categories and you actually believe, like a lot of Christians throughout history, and especially the early Protestants believe, that you understand the Bible uh, through a due use of the ordinary means, then the better evidence is very clearly on the side of saying that it's in Isaiah the prophet. You have some of the most reliable uh, uh, manuscripts there, uh, Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, they're not completely reliable. They have their their oddities for sure, but on the whole, they're pretty reliable manuscripts. Uh, 33, like I said, is pretty reliable. <coughs> Excuse me. And then you also get uh, some of the earliest attestation uh, possible. You have the Greek version of Irenaeus. Irenaeus is a second century church father, and that's his original language. It's hard to get a lot closer than that. And you also have origin in his original language and even origin in translation, agreeing with that general reading. And like I said, in Latin, it doesn't really have the articles, so it's not going to support the reading with the article in it. But um, as far as the general reading, it supports it. And then there's also the issue of the diversity of witnesses. These are witnesses that obviously are not extremely dependent on one another. These come from different places. These come from different time periods. These are manuscripts that come from localities that actually differed uh, somewhat in the version of Christianity that was practiced uh, there. There were some local differences and those kinds of things. And yet they all happen to agree on this particular detail. Pretty good evidence that that particular detail is right. When it comes to in the prophets, yeah, there are a number of manuscripts that agree with it. In fact, it's the vast majority. The Byzantine text, excuse me, <coughs> Uh, most people would say is at least 90% of the manuscripts, um, and, and depending on the particular location in the New Testament that you're talking about, it could be as much as 95% of the manuscripts. Vast majority there, but like I said, those manuscripts are all so close together that um, there's not a whole lot of, there's just not uh, a lot of diversity of witness. These are all witnesses that generally come from basically just one place. And that is, of course, the, um, the Eastern Church um, from the ninth century and later, for the most part. There's a few of the Byzantine witnesses or witnesses that have some Byzantine tendencies that go back before that, like A and W, for example, um, go back pretty early, but the vast majority of them come much, 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 eh, much later. Um, so it's a very late development. 
and it's one that is very much so region specific. Um, this is this is an Eastern Orthodox thing. This is the text that comes basically out of Greek Eastern Orthodoxy. Um, very specific to that one particular group with at one particular time. And as far as auxiliary supporting evidence for it, you've got little things that show up here and there. You know, there's one manuscript in the Vulgate. There's one version of the Syriac. There is a marginal note in one manuscript in the Boharic version of the Coptic. My third cousin's second niece, 32 times removed. Um, the Ethiopic Slavonic that come considerably later. Um, the Latin version of Irenaeus, and not even all of the Latin version of Irenaeus, which was, again, something that was translated later, and it was copied much later, and we don't know how late that particular copy is. And, well, then, then you do get asterisks, I guess. That's something. Not much in comparison to the other ones, but that's something. So, what do we have here? We have a night and day difference in terms of the quality of evidence. The only way that somebody could look at this kind of information and say, yeah, in the prophets is the original answer, is if you uh, are defending a tradition, and I'm not the only one who's made that observation about these sorts of people, is that these are people who are going to reject a due use of the ordinary means in favor of basically whatever version of the text that they happen to like. And they might use a majority argument if that happens to suit their purposes. They might use an extreme minority argument if that happens to suit their purposes. But whatever they're doing, it's not a due, excuse me. It's not a due use of the ordinary means uh, that has been consistently applied in all cases. That's the one thing it definitely isn't. All right, so. That is what it is. Now, I did want to show you a graphic representation of this just because it's kind of fun to look at. I took uh, the readings that were listed in the UBS 5 and the, uh, the support for them, listed them out and categorized them by century, which is kind of fun. Yeah, Isaiah and the Prophets only has one witness in the 7th century. Uh, and then, just for the fun of it, I decided to skew uh, the data as much toward the reading Prophets as I could. So when it gave a a variable date for a witness. Sometimes in the uh, listing for manuscripts, sometimes they're not exactly sure where they come from. It could be 3rd century, it could be 4th century. Um, when it came to the reading for Isaiah, I always use the later date to make it look worse, and for prophets, I always use the earlier date to make it look better. So if the manuscript came from the 3rd or 4th century, if it was one for Isaiah, I said 4th. If it was prophets, I said 3rd, I made it look as good as I could, basically. But I still followed the basic premise that any reasonable person would when it comes to pretty much anything, is that you're going to look for uh, significantly independent witnesses. Uh, and so I didn't list every single Byzantine manuscript that is out there, because most of them are so close together that it's not really worth the time and effort as far as significantly independent witnesses are concerned. If you're just worried about counting noses, then you can do that. Uh, but like I said, you wouldn't do that in any other area of life. If you ask people um, to bring you copies of The Little Mermaid and they all bring the Disney version, that doesn't mean that the Disney version was what was original. Okay, majority is not a reasonable assessment of truth in any other area of life. It shouldn't be here, but there are weird people that are out there. Okay, so using reasonably independent witnesses, um, that's what I kept with, and basically kept with uh, the standard that the UBS 5 puts in. But I did make an exception for the prophets just to kind of lean it uh, towards that reading a little bit. I noticed that when it cites the Byzantine text, what it is citing is properly just the Byzantine text and saying, we looked at these particular manuscripts, E, F, G, H, P, and Sigma, uh, because those ones are good indicators. If these ones happen to have this reading, Odds are all the other Byzantine manuscripts are going to read pretty much the exact same way. Well, I went ahead and listed E, F, G, H, P, and Sigma uh, distinctly. So you have, you know, the P, the Sigma, E, F, G, all those ones listed separately out instead of just saying one manuscript, uh, one witness for Byzantine. So even though this obviously doesn't follow the majority text pattern, uh, I'm still trying to skew the independent witnesses data in favor of the prophets just to see what would happen. And um, as far as the raw data is concerned, I 
uh, got this bar graph. Uh, the red lines are the readings for Isaiah. The blue ones, excuse me, <coughs> are, like I said, the best version of doing the independent witnesses for pro the reading prophets. And then the green is Isaiah and prophets. It's that one conflated reading that comes from the Atala in the 7th century. And you can see that early on, the comparison of the various readings was pretty heavily in favor of Isaiah. Uh, at least up through the 5th century, most of the readings were Isaiah. And the earliest attestation was Isaiah. Then you get prophets showing up a little bit, but not by much. It doesn't really start to really take off until, you know, consistently, at least the 11th century, um, the amount of evidence that we have for independent witnesses from the 6th through the 8th century isn't very much, and even in the 9th century it's not very much. Excuse me. Um, so that is a little bit poorly represented, but we see a transition basically in there. There's more or less three periods. Early period, the reading Isaiah definitely dominates. The in-between period, we don't have a whole lot of good data uh, for as far as independent witnesses is concerned, but that seems to be the part where it uh, shifts over. And then once we get into the second millennium AD, then the reading prophets is pretty well established. But there definitely was an identifiable shift between them. And like I said, this data is a little bit messy. So one thing that you can do to help uh, solidify it is to write it down into quartiles. And so that's what I did, <coughs> excuse me, uh, just to make sure that the amount of data in each section was relatively consistent to give you a little bit better picture of how things compared. And when you do that, uh, breaking it into quartiles, you see that the first three quartiles, uh, the reading Isaiah definitely dominates and it's only in the last quartile that as far as independent witnesses are concerned that you get prophets dominating, but it's still not by much as far as independent witnesses are concerned. So if you're using a fairly reasonable standard, you want early, you want reliable, you want diverse. Um, yeah, Isaiah uh, blows the other uh, uh, variant readings out of the water easily. Um, but like I said, there's lots of people who are going to disagree with this, and it's frankly just going to be to maintain their tradition. You know, um, they'll use a standard, might be the majority uh, text or some other word standard that they come up with, that they wouldn't use in any other area, but they'll apply it to the Bible because they like particular readings and particular versions of the Bible that they happen to like. Not consistent at all, um, but that is the mark of traditionalism, is you tend to be rather inconsistent. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. All right, so that was kind of a relook at Mark 1 2. Now, one thing that I did want to mention before we close this out, and I know this is already getting kind of long, uh, but one thing that I did want to mention is that one, uh, like I said, there was this comment that had talked about Mark 1 2. And various other things, but especially Mark 1, 2 that I wanted to get back to, and I wound up deleting the comment just because I didn't have the time. Um, kind of regret that. It would have been nice to actually have it so that I could bring it up here, but in it, the person made the argument that the in the, in the early manuscripts, the Alexandrian text type, and like I said, with CBGM, we found that there are no really early text types. The only text type that actually is truly uh, unique in all of its readings and specific enough in all of its readings to be considered a text type is the Byzantine text type. The others have enough variation, enough difference uh, that they can actually be, reason uh, be considered reasonably independent. There's no text type early on. Uh, that is something that developed with time and standard and standardization, familiarity, production of one form over another, etc., etc. Uh, but this person basically claimed that the early manuscripts have the reading Isaiah because the early scribes were copying from Matthew and Luke and using their reading. And so let's take a look at Luke, for example. It says, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, and then it gives the quote. And there's a similar thing that goes on in Matthew. And we'll just go ahead and bring that up. Matthew. 
believe it's 3 3 instead of 3 4. Uh, for this is he who is spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, and then of course it gives the quote. And this person was arguing that, well, the person who was these early scribes, even though they make up the vast majority of the early period, even basically the first millennium of Christian history, the reading Isaiah predominates. But their explanation was that in these manuscripts, um, the vast majority of manuscripts in the first millennium, uh, that all of these uh, readings come from a scribe or scribes that had um, basically took the reading from Matthew and Luke and inserted it into Mark. And they were more familiar with Matthew and Luke, and so when they copied Mark, they copied it that way. There's a huge problem with that, though. It, first of all, it doesn't fit the external evidence. The external evidence is really clear that the reading Isaiah predominates, and if you break it out by century, you can see that it very clearly predominates early on um, by a good margin. Okay. So the idea that this other reading was the original one, and then they confused it later on just doesn't fit the external facts. So there's a problem. But on an internal level, there's another problem in that the forms are actually different. So in Matthew 3, 3, when it's talking about Isaiah the prophet, um, the Isaiah uh, the prophet that is mentioned there is in what is called the genitive form. And you compare that with Mark 1, 2. And I'll just go ahead and highlight this here. So you see the what looks like an O and a U ending for Isaiah and also on prophet. That is the um, diphthong U, and uh, it is indicative of the genitive. Let's go over to Mark 1 2, though. And when we have Isaiah the prophet, you'll notice that Isaiah ends with what looks like an A, it's alpha, with a subscript. It kind of looks like an I with a tail, it's iota. And uh, the prophet ends with an Eta looks kind of like an N with an extra tail, and again it has that little I with the tail. Uh, that's when it has that little tail underneath it like that. That's an in, uh, indicative that it's dative. So if they were copying from Mark, uh, sorry, from Matthew into Mark, they would have actually had to change the form of the word itself. And when people do conflated readings and those kinds of things, and where um, you get what is called parallel corruption, where someone has another version of the story in mind and they write that other version in mind, uh, I should say another version of the account. These aren't just simply stories. This is historical uh, fact. If you're a biblical Christian, you believe that it's historical fact. So when I say story, I mean it's account. This is what happened. Um, when people mix up accounts like that, they'll mix it up with uh, the form. This is the form that I'm used to saying it in, and you write that in. And that is going to include the particular, um, uh, what is it called? Sorry, the particular case, genitive, dative, or cases. Um, and it will include that. But here it doesn't. You would have to transpose something that was in the genitive into the dative. So going from Matthew, uh, so some scribe uh, miscopying Mark on the basis of what uh, Matthew says doesn't work. It's completely different forms. Yeah, it's the same root word, but the form is completely different. Uh, maybe they were copying from Luke instead. So let's go back to Luke 3, 4, and we'll see if it's the one that has the dative. So we have Isaiah the prophet here, and you'll notice that OU, Omicron, Upsilon, Defunct U ending. Well, that one's genitive again. Okay, so Luke and Matthew, they're in the genitive. Mark is in the dative. It's a completely different case. It's a completely different form. And so if they were to accidentally copy from uh, Luke or Matthew in a form that they had memorized, they're going to memorize it with the cases. And that should have come across in the Markan text, but it didn't. So on the grounds of the external evidence, the history is going the wrong way. The earliest evidence is for Isaiah. The predominant early evidence is for Isaiah. Their claim is that, well, it was originally prophets, and then some scribes messed it up, and then they got it right again at the end. Um, but it just doesn't match the, the external facts. And then, like I said, internally, it's the wrong form of the words. 
It's confusing the dative and the genitive, which in parallel corruption, you don't usually see. That is not a normal way for things to be parallel, uh, for parallel corruption to happen. Um, and it's not that, you know, textual critics don't know that that's a possibility. It's just one that they rejected because it doesn't match the external facts. And it also just doesn't match the way that parallel corruption happens. Parallel corruption happens when the surrounding material is enough that both the words and the form of those words can be superimposed into the text. You don't have that here. It's a different form. It's not close enough to transpose one for the other. And like I said, there's also no external evidence to back it up. I've heard people try to make that argument, and frankly, it's a really weak argument. It's just awful. All right, so that was just an analysis of the evidence surrounding Mark 1, 2, and basically trying to explain why the UBS... <coughs> yeah, I hate that cough. Why the UBS 5 editors, as well as a lot of other textual scholars, would agree that this is a sure reading. It has a rating of A. This is a certain text. The evidence is real clear on this one. Your most reliable witnesses have Isaiah the prophet. Your earliest witnesses have Isaiah the prophet. The diversity of the witnesses that disagree in other areas but happen to agree on this one points to Isaiah the prophet. Those are reasonable standards that you could apply consistently to any other area of truth. You would look for reliable witnesses. You would look uh, for the earliest witness if there's a chain of witnesses coming down. You'd want the people who are closest to the event. And then you would also be impressed by having a diversity of witnesses who might disagree on all these things, but if they happen to agree, so, agree on this one detail, it's really good evidence that that one detail is true. Instead of having, you know, the vast majority of witnesses that might agree on pretty much everything, which wouldn't be surprising if it all comes from one particular source that's not diverse, it's not going to be very impressive. Okay. A due use of the ordinary means makes it really clear reading is Isaiah the prophet. And that is a whole lot of detail that you guys were probably not wanting, and I apologize for that, but if you wanted to go deep on Mark 1-2, there it is. Thank you for your time and attention. For those of you who are in Christ, go with God and be blessed. And for those of you who are not, I pray that we come to a true understanding of the real Christ of history, the only genuine Savior of mankind. Amen.